Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our final webinar in our summer webinar series on building resilient and sustainable communities in Ireland. My name is Aoife Corkin, and I'm a senior staff officer here at the Housing Agency working in the area of sustainable communities. I'm joined today by my colleague Mary Coffey, who's running the back end of the webinar, and by our speaker today, Dr. Marcus Collier from Trinity College. Before we start, I would just like to draw your attention to a couple of things. First of all, we have a Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. If you have any questions, we would ask that you use the Q&A function. The Q&A feature provides you with an option to post anonymously. If you just want to make comments, please add them to the chat function. As I mentioned over the last couple of weeks, we do have requests to share who you are on our, on our webinars. However, for various reasons, we can't do this. But if you'd like to share who you are and where you're from, please do so in the chat feature. As this is the final webinar, I'd ask you if you have any ideas for further topics for our autumn webinar series, to please add them to the chat function or send them in to me by email. Finally, just be aware that this session has been recorded and will be made available on the Housing Agency YouTube channel later in the week. The slides will also be made available. The agenda for today's webinar is as follows. I'll give a very short introduction to the Housing Agency in the webinar series. Dr. Marcus Collier will then present his work on nature-based solutions and housing development. And we'll then have a Q&A session where we would encourage you to participate and ask any relevant questions you may have. As always, if we can't answer your questions as part of the webinar, we will make every effort to answer them afterwards. We aim to keep today's webinar to 50 minutes. The Housing Agency, which is hosting this series, is a state agency based on Upper Mount Street in Dublin. The Housing Agency works with and supports local authorities, approved housing bodies, the Department of Housing Planning and Local Government, and the private sector in the delivery of housing and housing services. Our vision is to enable everyone to live in good quality, affordable homes in sustainable communities. It's the Housing Agency vision for achieving sustainable communities which has inspired this webinar series. The aim of the series is to contribute and to stimulate discussion on resilience and sustainability topics which are relevant for housing, to raise awareness of the importance of building resilient and sustainable communities in light of local, national and global shocks to the system, and to create opportunities for collaboration in future projects. This webinar series explores four topics which are relevant for housing. The three previous webinars focused on taking a collaborative approach to retrofitting, intergenerational housing and regeneration, and green spaces in urban places. Today, we are delving into the world of nature-based solutions in the context of housing. On that note, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Marcus Collier. Dr. Collier is an assistant professor in urban nature-based innovation in the School of Natural Sciences in Trinity College, Dublin, where he's also director of research. He is the coordinator of the Horizon 2020 Nature-Based Solutions Project, Connecting Nature, and he was the coordinator of the Taurus FP7 project. Marcus's research interests focus on the complex and fascinating interface between social and ecological systems, especially scaling out nature-based solutions in, in an urbanizing world, and the potential of innovation and nature-based enterprises. Marcus, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Eva um, and Mary, and I appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, I'll just share my screen with you now and, and get the, uh, this, this PowerPoint uh, going. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, connecting nature uh, a little bit at the beginning. Um, I'm going to focus a lot on what, what we're talking about when we, when we, when we speak about nature-based solutions, what we mean about nature-based solutions, um, and how will they apply in, in a housing context. Um, it, it's a very new term, relatively speaking. It's, it's only since about 2005, 2006 that it was being knocked about, and only in the last maybe decade have we started using and researching into what the potential for nature-based solutions are. Um, the project that I'm running called Connecting Nature, which is, um, we all are at the beginning, all happy, hopefully, um, at the beginning of our project. Uh, it's, uh, it's a large uh, European project um, with the 31 partners uh, in, in, in the European uh, continent and the wider European area. And we also have the aspiration and we've started working with um, the, the cities in Brazil, China, Korea, and uh, part of Europe, the Caucasus that we're also trying to develop um, relationships with. It's around a little under 12 million euro of a project. 
Um, and the European Union is contributing 11, just short of 11 and a half. And we've got 200 people uh, working on the project um, all told, uh, some full-time, some part-time and um, in different types of uh, relationships. There's uh, just a broad map of where we're all from. It's a little bit complex um, to deal with, but this is a lot simpler. This is essentially the structure of the project. And it's the same structure that we had when we ran the Taurus project, which was a previous um, 9 million euro uh, European funded project um, that looked at how we transition towards building resilience in, in urban areas. We, about a third of our, uh, by far the largest number of partners in the project are city authorities, um, followed then by small and medium enterprises, and then about a third, then a little under a third um, academic community. And we work a lot with the communities of people in uh, areas within those cities. So um, roughly what are we talking about when we're talking about nature-based solutions? Um, these are um, technically it's called, oops, I beg your pardon, I think I've slipped out of the, uh, uh, that are inspired and supported by nature, that are cost effective and provide simultaneous benefits or co-benefits. This is the definition of the European Commission uh, uses. And as recently as January, we managed to get that qualified a little more because it's quite a broad uh, definition of what a nature-based solution might be. Um, so the most recent iteration says that if it doesn't enhance or support biodiversity or ecosystem services, it cannot be called a nature-based solution. So we're getting a little bit more closer to what um, we're hoping to get a more definite definition or more defined um, uh, use of the phrase. Um, I, I, I'm always sort of slow to use this phrase, but I, I think it's no harm to throw it up there. Essentially, we're looking at nature as a form of technology. So it's essentially competing with existing forms of infrastructure, sometimes referred to as gray infrastructure, um, that would, be, would, would do the same tasks, for whether it's to do with climate issues, excessive heat, excessive water, or not enough water, um, carbon sequestration, biodiversity, and so on. Other common urban uh, environmental issues, noise, dust, air quality, and so on. Um, significant social issues relating to uh, urbanization, and as we found in the recent, uh, in the current, I should say, pandemic, where cities are um, really being looked to now for the full gamut of live, work, and play um, pr provision. So things like social cohesion, well-being, health, and other regreening initiatives. And then of course, the economic side. I mean, we can't just um, you know, throw nature and throw greenery into a city. There has to be a, some sort of business case made for it because of course, someone has to pay for this. It has to be costed out. And that's a lot of what we're doing in our project. We're looking at developing finan financial models for, 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 for regreening cities or greening, whether they're regreening re or greening cities in the first place. But it's not, it's not biomimicry, it's not copying nature or developing some form of artificial, like a membrane or a, some sort of artificial mechanism for um, uh, you know, you know, mimicking nature. This is actually the idea is to, to uh, bring, to have nature in cities, but having much more benefits or more co-benefits that, that you can derive from, from this. I'll go into this in a bit more detail. Don't get panicked when you see this. Um, I'm going to let, let you have these, these slides because each one of these is hot linked uh, these, the, to the different uh, actions and different projects that are around Europe at the moment. I just wanted to show you what the current level of interest is. So just from Horizon 2020 point of view, um, we have uh, around 100 cities involved in a dozen projects the European Commission has committed 185 million euro in research and innovation funding, uh, going up to 240 million by the end of next year. This doesn't include the projects that will be starting in September. I might mention one of them, which is called Go Green Roots, of which I'm a partner, but is run through the University of Limerick, which is looking at health and well-being and walking in cities, um, which we might we might refer back to later on. And then on the other side, we have just mentions of other resources and projects that you can link into just by way of indicating where we're going. And in all of this, the European Commission is clustering um, task forces um, around nature-based solution, so, solutions. And if you were looking at the recent announcement on the European Green Deal, Ursula van der Leyen was 
presentation, you'll have seen that she mentions nature-based solutions about 11 times in it, um, specifically looking at not just um, greening the Irish, uh, the, sorry, greening the European economy, but also restarting the European economy through nature-based approaches. So this is the idea of innovating with nature in cities, which is um, quite an, uh, an ambitious um, uh, ask. So um, I'm conscious of using a lot of words, so it's time we just look at some more relaxing images and uh, what we're talking about here. So typically what, what nature-based solutions uh, look like or what they do, we have, some of you might well be familiar with a lot of these, I, I assume, things like bioswales or suds or, or rain gardens as they're sometimes referred to in North America. Um, we have living structures, living walls. Um, we try to avoid the phrase green roof and green wall because it, 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 it doesn't really describe what it's doing. It's more of a living wall or a living roof. Um, and there are an interior living walls, which I'll talk about um, a little later on. Um, I'll talk about uh, some of the other types of co-benefits in terms of biodiversity and innovation. But also I thought we would just rest a moment looking at uh, some images uh, later on about water attenuation and, um, and the, the image that you see there is a, a social housing complex in uh, Barking and Dagenham in, in London. So a very similar type of situation um, to Ireland, and all, albeit on a larger scale, but certainly there will be lessons to be learned from developments like that. <clears throat> um, when it comes to housing, um, there's lots of different types of, of, of I suppose there's a, it's a, it, there's a lot of moving parts when it comes to housing, as, as you all well know, uh, I don't need to tell you that. Um, there's lots of uh, discussion about how we design things, how we innovate, how we use space, how we create communities, how um, we, um, we, we talk about the, the, the occupant. Is the house being just constructed just to house someone or is it to, to, to be a, a home to some people? And we look at the value added um, aspects of housing. And then in our project, we try to, we're trying to identify finance, uh, finance mechanisms for mainstreaming nature-based solutions in a housing or a city or an urban context. Um, it does have the same resonances and applications in non-urban areas. I just want to make sure I'm not just focusing on urban, but all those projects I showed you tend to be focusing on the urban context, at least at the moment. The central picture there just shows you um, that's the department I'm in, the botany department. I wish I had an office in that building, it's so nice, but I'm afraid I'm in a rather boring office somewhere else off on the campus. But what it also shows is the uh, new nature-based solutions that were constructed just on the campus in Trinity. In the foreground, you see a form, a form of bioswale or a rain garden that attenuates runoff from the buildings. And in the background, you see the new business school where you have um, I'm probably going to pronounce this incorrectly, a brise soleil, I hope if there's an architect that uh, might correct my, my language there. Essentially, there, it's, a, it's a biodiverse um, shutters, essentially shading out the building. Um, um, what's, so what we have here is, a, is sort of a new generation of, of nature-based solutions surrounding, ironically, uh, the Department of Botany, which has a repository of nature um, going back uh, two centuries. So it's sort of a nice little juxtaposition there. So that's what we're kind of talking about in terms of potential nature-based solutions. Um, I like to think of it in two, two ways. I like to think of nature as, as we, had, we already have a significant amount of existing nature-based solutions or legacy nature-based solutions in cities. Of course, we're talking about street trees and parks. I know Gerald spoke last time, if those of you who are attending the previous uh, webinar, Gerald will have talked about the, the street trees. And those of you who were involved in the, if anyone was involved in the, in the Lewis Cross City will know that O'Connell Street, for example, um, and the street trees that are planted along the, the new Lewis are in extremely large pits that are specifically built as nature-based solutions to absorb runoff um, and to allow the trees to, to grow to a decent size. Um, but what we're noticing now as our society is changing, uh, we're noticing, of course, we, we, know, we know about more apartment living and an increased demand and for, for green spaces or open spaces, specifically green spaces. Um, we also are seeing a new usage of our parks. We see new communities using, using green spaces slightly differently than we would see in the past. We see people using green spaces for exercise and not just football pitches, but uh, the more formal parts of parks. 
for exercises, Tai Chi or yoga and so on, family gatherings, uh, religious um, uh, usage and so on. So we see our legacy nature-based solutions being used um, differently or um, with more um, demands on them. I tend to refer to these as socially prescribed nature-based solutions. And this really came to a head during the coronavirus, um, 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 the peak last couple of months where people were being told for your benefit of your, your health, get outside, go out into the green, you know, see, see some green stuff, uh, touch trees, be in, be in nature. And you, we got the, re the reply back saying, well, there's too many people in the parks. Uh, there's too, it's too, they're too full and we're now going to have to cap people going into parks. Our thinking there is, is should be the other way around. It should be that we should be having more parks rather than stopping people visiting them. But we have a certain amount of nature-based um, solutions, which are uh, street trees and parks that are doing a very good job in cities. They're acting as wind buffers. They're absorbing a significant amount of carbon and they fulfill a significant amount of our social and, uh, and well-being and health and well-being needs. Um, so they're already working away and they have been for quite a while. Anybody who's from the planning background will know that the history of urban planning is replete with various movements to, to address things like the Industrial Revolution and, and pollution using parks and so on. What I really want to talk more about though are the um, the, the more constructed nature-based solutions, the ones that go more for the residential side of things. Um, and we see that, you know, there's living roofs, living walls, rain gardens, sustainable urban drainage systems, um, and so on. And we see these also have the potential for, for, for fulfilling a number of, of benefits to the, the direct community that they're in. So absorbing flooding literally outside your house or home uh, or garden or the wider community is if we were to somehow find a way to join all of this up in cities to mainstream nature-based solutions in all our developments um, you will see that that we could have a very different type of city and a very different type of urban area and that's what a lot of these nature-based solution projects are trying to do they're developing working with cities as front runners and followers to try and have a mentor mentee relationship to show each other and have cities speaking to each other and sharing their experiences and their knowledge so that they can scale it out because of course every city has different geological and, and climate uh, issues as well as social issues so sometimes there isn't a one size fits all and i could say the same thing about housing there isn't a one size fits all though we do try to think of that like that but you know it's it, there are nuanced differences between communities and so not every nature-based solution will be as applicable to every single community however there's a few broad uh, similarities between them just a little bit of a background, we're probably most familiar with the sedum roof, the, the living the roof, or used to be called green roof um, uh, um, format. And that's pretty much rolled out. There's plenty of sedum roofs happening around, uh, occurring around our cities and towns. Um, uh, but it's very quickly moved on as we've done more and more research to being more focused on a living roof, um, roofs that are not just there to be um, above our heads and do the job of insulating the building or perhaps attenuating water um, or perhaps shading uh, the uh, or, or uh, keeping heat out of buildings in some cases um, as it is in the top um, right on my side the Vancouver Conference Centre very much to do with water and heat but they focus a lot more now on diverse uses of the roof and actually bringing people onto roofs in many cities where you know, where there's very high, high uh, level of, um, um, there's a lot, very high, high numbers of people. I, I, uh, there, it is difficult to find a green space or a space to put green roofs. So the roofs are the, the natural uh, location for a lot of these. So you see in, in some cities, especially in North American cities and parts of Europe, some of the larger cities near Paris specifically, I can think of Berlin too, where they will be create, there's a lot of movement to create roofs that have much, much higher diversity of, of species in them if they're just a living roof or uses and species if they're going to be used in, in the form of gardening or, or recreation and so on. This is just a, a shot, uh, didn't come out so well actually, is a shot of our experimental uh, roof in the Barking Dagenham area that I'm going to talk about a little later on. Um, the, this in, in the previous project where we experimented with different types of substrates. These are all substrates from crushed 
building material and different types of, of roofs. Some of them, for example, would, would not necessarily be green. We're actually looking at blue roofs, but roofs that are just water. Um, bit risky, I, I know, but uh, we're, we're, this, this is an experimental area, proving very informative to the planners and to policymakers, which we just let them have all our data. It's very difficult to get data on living roofs and living walls because much of it has been driven by the private sector. So the intellectual property is, re is resting with the, the private sector. So sometimes it makes it a bit difficult to get information, um, which is the main reason why we also have small and medium enterprises in our projects so that they can both be the help to develop the idea, but also to provide us with the information without, it, um, without them losing their intellectual property. Um, and so here we see parts of New York, parts of London, parts of Paris again, um, where roofs have become much more diverse, much more useful. Um, and in some cases, there's commercial farming going on on roofs, as we'll see, as you, you, you'll see in some locations. Um, uh, we know that, that the, the, um, the Grow It Yourself people in, in, have also got similar plans in, in this respect. So it is, it is always uh, possible. And then this is transferred to other types of roofs and rooms of bicycle shelters and bus, bus shelters and, um, and picnic areas and so on and so forth. And you get, we start to get into the more design side because of course these are closer to eye level and people like to, they like to be seen. Um, and the, the one in the center there, which is in Tower Hamlets, uh, was constructed um, as, a, as a form of community action. And the, the gate you see there on the top right is a living structure on a gate constructed by Scottscape, which is one of the market leaders in this area, a company which has a connections in Ireland. Um, and so on. So we start to see these becoming more socially desired. Uh, people are asking more for them. Um, even though most people can't see them if they're standing underneath them, they still like to know they're there. It's, it's an interesting um, I, uh, state of affairs. Um, principally, I think we, sh we should be seeing an awful lot more bus shelters with uh, living rooms. Um, if you were to connect all the bus shelters in some ways, and that's what insects do, they connect. Um, you can have a, a, a dual use per bus shelter and also have high biodiversity and support biodiversity in cities. And this is very much part of what we're trying to do in the, in, with Trinity and the All-Ireland Pollinator Plan and my colleague Jane Stout trying to encourage this type of alternative thinking uh, when it comes to uh, nature-based approaches. Conscious of time here, so I'll just um, uh, go through a few more. Of course, we have the combination of living roofs and um, uh, other types of sustainability activities. And this is sometimes referred to as a bio solar roof. This is the one we had as an experimental site. Um, and we, we constructed it near the London Olympic site um, from the previous project. But you see them cropping up all over the place. And it is an ideal a match made in heaven if you think about it because biodiversity needs uh, people to be not there most of the time. And so does bio uh, solar panels would, would you know, you're required not to have access. So this is actually quite a multiple win scenario in a roof situation. Um, so the living roof st structures have very much uh, um, proceeded apace and there's a lot of um, examples and, and a lot of um, measurement of the efficacy of living roofs going on. So we do have, as a technology, we are finding that it is able to hold its own with um, other types of roof technologies. Clearly we're talking about flat roofs here, but there are also sloped versions of it um, that are being developed and slanted uh, roofs, not necessarily the pitch that we have in some of our houses um, and our old housing stock, but um, you know, that's, that's something we, we could also develop. Um, looking at living walls, this was very much driven by the aesthetics, but very quickly people found out, as we have this example from this hotel down here, you can see on the, at the bottom left, in London, the, the roof um, well, is, is certainly, um, as you see on the right hand picture, retaining a significant amount of heat. And the hotel that um, spent money on this experimental living wall has noticed um, a very significant uh, savings in terms of heat. Uh, um, unfortunately, the downside of this is people stopping outside the hotel to look at the roof is causing traffic congestion. So not everything has a um, <laughs> has a, an even uh, all good scenario. Um, the living wall, though, we're moving away a lot now. Um, you might be familiar with, if those are familiar with London, the Elephant and Castle um, um, tube stop. But all throughout Europe, 
we're developing more biodiverse living walls. One of the difficult things, of course, about biodiversity is it dies and it's part of the process. So clients don't like to see dead structures on the outside of buildings or on top of buildings. So sometimes we have to um, play with plants that are evergreen and not necessarily high in biodiversity. So the nature part of nature-based solutions doesn't really kick in. However, there's, there's a lot of trials going on and those, that Reed Soleil that I showed you in Trinity is one of those trials. trials. And already there a year, we've measured um, something in the region of, we had a master's student this summer up on a cherry picker uh, during the lockdown, measuring about 45 different species of insect and three species of bird nesting in it. That's only there a year. So, you know, diversity has a, a habit of coming when you, it's uh, sort of a field of dreams. If you build it, they will come uh, scenario. Um, there is also the living walls, indoor living wall uh, scenario. Um, the bottom right picture is one of onboard BIA's offices, uh, not too far from UEFA uh, here in Dublin. Uh, that was meant to be a map of the world, but of plants being what plants do, they tended to merge here. So we've got a rather muddled up uh, Asia and Africa there in the center. Um, and the moss on the door is thriving, it is not in any soil whatsoever. That is in a, a very simple watering structure and it is doing extremely well. Um, caveat here is the one on the, on the left there the, with the tables, a three story uh, high indoor living structure in the airport in Malta is in fact plastic. So we are getting, we're starting to see the, the same level of greenwashing that we would have seen in the past in terms of people using and, and jumping on the bandwagon. Uh, it does do the, some of the tasks that a living structure would do in terms of noise, perhaps, but it doesn't have any of the other effects that an indoor living wall has. And just share this slide with you of some of the, some, some studies that were done in Wageningen and about this, um, not only about humidity and comfort, but also psychological impacts of living structures in, uh, inside buildings. Not necessarily plants all around like potted plants, but having a wall constructed out of out of a living structure has uh, can have significant um, impact on the residents or the owners or the occupants. So we see um, schools, for example, starting to use the, the some schools anyway are looking to have living structured walls inside because it helps with concentration. And we're we're building a building in Trinity at the moment. Hopefully, it gets back to building soon, and it will have living structures in all its classrooms in order to help with concentration and innovation um, and, and so on. So this is quite a lot of co-benefits that come from living walls, which are really only the beginning stages of being looked at um, experimentally. Um, so you will know about some of the examples of bioswales. This is just some, some examples here. Um, just that large picture there on the, the left is the uh, tower hamlets, again, the living structure. So the rainwater is attenuated on the roof of, a, of an old council building. Then it is, when it does come off the roof, it goes into these rain barrels. You see just there at the, the, the left hand side. Then it goes into these rain gardens. And finally, it'll end up in the public system. About 80% is attenuated and it released slowly. So during storm water episodes, this, these buildings can really be quite effective at controlling excessive amounts of runoff. And this is the type of thing we're trying to see, we would like to see in a, a housing context in, in Ireland. And you're familiar with uh, some of this type of thing. Um, and finally then just looking at Barking and Dagenham, these are social houses and so they have a formal uh, settling pond and an informal one, uh, which is, sorry about my photographs, a little bit skewed there. Um, but the playground that I'm standing on taking the photograph is also meant to flood. So this, uh, this is a whole flood zone um, and it's there beside the Thames. It's, 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 um, it, it had the uh, the aspiration of no water coming should come from this new development into the Thames without first having settled. So we do have these type of things, it's not the most prettiest, but we have a, a large settling pond, rainwater going in there, community area. On the right there is a school with living structures on the roofs. So we see in new developments this idea of incorporating nature-based solutions that are both doing a, a job for us in terms of keeping the uh, floodwaters uh, controlled, but also uh, keeping our, um, um, uh, keep, keep providing opportunity for other types of recreation and health and well, well-being activities as well. This particular one was co-created, so it wasn't just a developer coming in with an idea. This was a community-led program. So we, were, we're, we, we do like the idea, we want to encourage the idea that 
housing doesn't necessarily have to be developer led. I know it currently is a lot of the times or, 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 or uh, council led, but it can also be community led as we see in some small examples we have in Ireland of a community developed or community led like the eco village and so on. But that doesn't have to be the exception. Uh, this, it could be the rule that people will co-design and given, given enough time and given enough knowledge, uh, people will come up with, as you see it on the right there, that's the type of ideas that people came up with in meetings like we had here, here in, in Barking and Dagenham uh, in the past. Um, I won't talk too much about heat because um, it's, uh, maybe tomorrow we might need it, but um, we are constructing a lot of, of artificial, um, basically living rooms around Europe. And these are essentially to mitigate the heat island that happens in other countries, not so much a problem in Ireland, but certainly in many other countries it is. And we've even taken this and made it a mobile version of it to, to, to use as a way of engaging communities in the co-creation process in the first place. And this was all during, during the tourist project that uh, I worked with Aoife on. So just to finish up, some of the co-benefits of nature-based solutions really are um, a high quality of life by having people living in, in a housing establishment or housing estate that is nature-oriented, their sustainability behavior will change. They will become more sustainable. And so therefore we will be able to realize a lot of the other goals we want as a society in terms of recycling and energy use and transport and so on, car use. Um, so, you know, by having it in your house or having it close to your house and recognizing that nature is doing a job and not just there for your, your kids to throw a ball around on, it's also doing a job for you. It's, it's a good way of telling communities, this is your, it, it's your local um, way of, of contributing to the environment and contributing to environmental issues and climate issues. Um, we are also seeing that there's a huge societal demand, as we know now through the, the corona issues, a huge societal demand for more uh, green space and more diverse green space. My area is to look at how this, how we can innovate with these in terms of design innovation or financial innovation or uh, other types of innovations, the company innovations that will come with this because companies are the ones who construct these things, but they're also the ones who maintain, maintain these. So a lot of this means that a local authority can actually um, have a better control of what's going on because companies will take care of a lot of the the um, the management of these new nature-based solutions um, and we're starting to see the the desire for green over gray I've, I've never really been too happy with that phrase but we know that green infrastructure generally appreciates over time while gray infrastructure tends to need repairs and, and upgrading over time so it can be very cost effective and it can be very um, competitive with uh, non-nature-based solutions. So rainwater um, harvesting and rainwater attenuation can compete effectively with the old-fashioned big huge pipe under the ground and, and get the water away as fast as we can type of approach. Um, so innovating with, with nature really is also a way of defining how we are as a community and um, defines us as an, an urban community in the, in the future. So um, these are just a, just a whistle stop of, I'll, I'll talk about, I can talk about some of the challenges there, but I won't, I'm conscious of time. Um, but I'm also happy to take any questions as much as I possibly can here today. And if not, I can follow up with you um, over the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Aoife. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you very much um, for a very interesting topic and uh, one we haven't covered yet um, in our webinar series. I've got uh, lots of questions coming in there, so hopefully you have a, a couple of minutes to, to spare and, and some thoughts. The first question we've got in is, um, actually we've got a couple of questions about, um, I suppose, local authorities taking uh, things in charge. So we have a question here, in relation to swales and att attenuation ponds, councils tend to be reluctant to take them in charge. Have you come across this as a challenge? So we've a couple of questions here about different challenges, I suppose. That is one of the most uh, the most common thing we have, and I think we all remember that anyone who's my age anyway with the grey beard will remember the sensible children stay away from water and the ads in the 1970s that were very frightening uh, about the dangers of still water and deep waters especially. Um, but some of the images I showed, some of the cities we're working with, Glasgow is one of our cities um, where we have um, clearly a very significant danger having water attenuation ponds near people's houses. Ironically enough, and I, 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 want, I want to knock wood when I say that, but so far, those places where we've seen um, community engaging with their, their, their local nature-based solutions, we don't see that, the, the, we certainly don't see the, the vandalism, like 
the supermarket trolley or traffic cone going in there. We do, obviously, in some places. We don't see it as much. We definitely don't see the, the devil may care, like kids jumping in, like we see on the canal here, um, approach happening, which, which we would have once seen in London and in Glasgow. But those two places where we have put in and we have seen good examples of over a very long period of time, um, the key thing in this whole process was the community, not just engagement in a sort of a tokenistic sort of way, but co-creation, allowing communities to say, well, if we're going to put a pond in there, could we put it over there? Because it might be a little safer or, or whatever it is. So people getting more involved in the design process. We're also finding that community do have the capacity, even communities that wouldn't normally be able to capacity for, uh, 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 like uh, Aoife will know this in terms of literacy and, and map reading abilities and so on. Some cities, some communities have this issue. We still see a genuine um, um, effort and a genuine positivity over people with people. And when it comes to water attenuation, we don't, as yet, we haven't seen any of the issues which I, I had suspected we would see um, uh, are cropping up. Things, the mo most thing is local authority before insurance and safety. That's clearly the first, the first and foremost. So what we did is being one of these projects was purely engaging with the insurance companies to do this. So the insurance company realized actually it's going to save us money. So we better get on board with this in pay out in a paying out of flooding. So when people go on board, they're more positive about ways of solving some of the more technical side of things with the architects and the designers and the planners. But the principle behind it is accepted and it is very uh, useful for, um, um, for, certainly for in our situation, water attenuation would be probably what I say, one of the biggest issues we have uh, in terms of climate so far. Yeah, so we've had a warm summer to date, but we're definitely uh, familiar with uh, uh, excessive water here in Ireland. We have another question in, Mark, is about barriers, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Have you identified any barriers to the ad adoption of nature-based solutions in the planning system development plans or development management? Have the, you looked at how climate adaptation policy in Ireland is not promoting or linking with nature-based solutions? So a bit of a big question there. There's, there's, there's several parts to that question. The first one is, is yes, there have uh, nature-based dissolutions or anti-solutions, there's nature-based problems as well. Um, so when we, when we put a, a lot of nature-based solutions in an area, it typically looks quite nice, it typically gets more greener, and then we start to see gentrification. So the first thing that happens is, especially with communities where there was the most need, they have the lowest number of access to parks. For example, we see this in Glasgow. We have a community in Glasgow on the Clyde that have a park nearby, but the gate is way on the other side, about three kilometers away. And so they can't get into the park. So you put nature-based solutions there, you start to improve the, the, and increase the property value, and that edges out the poorest of people into other locations where, again, we have the problem again. So we do see potential barriers to nature-based solutions. These are not so easily overcome, but they, are, they can be overcome on the policy level, on a planning level, they can be overcome with, I won't say a pen stroke, but with, with a very minimal amount of effort. You can make a decision to say, right, this is, we can cap rent, so we can do this. And since most, much of the home ownership might actually be the local authority themselves, this is controllable. Um, but we do see other, other possible um, uh, barriers to nature-based solutions, things like people with asthma and, um, and also people who don't like having a park nearby because it attracts too many teenagers and joggers and all sorts of people. So some people don't have a, have a cultural dislike of having lots of people nearby. Some parks are actually scary for certain members of society. Elderly people, for example, don't like to walk too much in a park at certain times or women running on their own. Parks can actually be quite dangerous in some people's minds. So it isn't a panacea here. It's, it's, it's part of a general move as a, as a society. Now, the second question, Aoife, in terms of climate, say that again. <laughs> uh, just bear with me. It says, have you looked at oh, how yes. climate adaptation policy in Ireland is or is not promoting and linking with nature-based solutions? Yes, yes. And actually a, a, a lot of the researchers in this area is in Irish universities and, and, um, and also in local authorities are looking at how you could have a policy from the local authority on biodiversity, biodiversity action plan, and then you could have a planning which mentions biodiversity oh. and biodiversity mentions planning. But we do have this problem, and I think we'll all agree that we have a siloed thinking. This isn't just Ireland, it's in every country we've come into. Part of the reason for these big, huge projects is to try and break down the silo barriers between cities and try and get innovations we can do that with, things like information sharing between departments. 
um, making sure we all have an equal voice at the table. There isn't all the engineering guys talking and all the, the architects talking and, you know, the biodiversity yeah. and the heritage people are going, well, hang on, I have a voice here too. So sometimes there is, there's an inherent way because that's the way we work. We work, we, we compartmentalize because that's how we get our work done more efficiently. But then there's an inherent barrier to crossing over that. And that is not just an Irish problem. That is a global problem. And some cities have made it, the Sponge Cities program in, in China is attempting to do that. Our colleagues, if you remember, in, this, in the Verband region in Stuttgart in Germany, mm -hmm. trying to do that. So there are some examples of where there has been. But I, I wouldn't be able to point singly at a particular location where everybody is, is, has a halo over their head. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, we've kind of a, a more localised question here. So there's lots of existing housing estates with very bland open areas which could be retrofit to enhance or embrace biodiversity. Mm. How can we encourage existing communities and local authorities to embrace new concepts? So we, we started in the tourist project and we did, we're doing it in Connecting Nature and a lot of doing it where we go into a community um, with, let's say, we're going to meet up and not have an agenda. We don't have a particular agenda. We, we let it emerge out of conversations. And um, it, it has to be facilitated in a sort of a way. And obviously, this starts off, always on variably starts off confrontational with litter and vandalism and crime. And, you know, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. The usual things that happen at all of these community meetings. Then it emerges that community are talking about, well, if there was something we could get our teeth into, what could we do? And you'd mentioned then at that stage, what about this rather bland green area out here? What could we do? That then starts to get people thinking about what we do. And if you look at, um, uh, if anyone was involved with um, the uh, Cork Street, um, what's, what's the, uh, we, not Weaver, what's the skate park? Bridge, Bridgefoot Street. Mark. No, no, the other one we, we put the um, in tourist projects, uh, Weaver, no, is it Weaver? Uh, Weaver, yeah. Weaver Park, yes, thank you. Yeah, well. Weaver. So we went in there with some landscape architects, um, some academics, lots of local people, with tarmac on the ground, with broken bottles, we climbed over the hoarding, gave people chalk and said, tell us what you'd like to see. And they drew skate parks, they drew a bit of nice, we said, look, hang on, where, about, where will the old people go? Where will the kids play? Where will the... And people, when they're given that challenge, will design that. And so Weaver Park will be a really good example of a co-created nature-based solution because in fact it's it's sunken down a little bit so that if you ever do get a flood on Cork Street it will attenuate a lot of water. I know there's a lot of impermeable surfaces there for the skating part but but the playground has got an enormous sink there underneath it. So you know sometimes the engagement process takes a bit to go to get going and then ask people and then say to people don't just uh, tell us what you want show us go out there and show us you know let's let's get a dialogue going on that. That offers the opportunity of the council to say, well, actually, we only have a certain amount of money. A lot of communities will meet you some way. They could provide even or fundraise a certain amount of it. And even 5% matching funding from a, from a community is, is a, a sign of faith, which almost ensures that the post-construction vandalism and other things diminish significantly. As with that Tower Hamlets one I showed you, the park across the road is now being managed by the local community. Um, through the, with the coordination of the unions of the, the local authority, the borough of Tower Hamlets. So um, a nice arrangement was made there because they discovered a lot of the union members who work in the park actually live in there. So they, they actually went, this is great. So there's, there's, things can emerge during the co-creation process that offer opportunities for cities, or sorry, councils to get across some of the barriers that would have been are traditionally there. They can also use this engagement process to engage them in other issues in the community that probably more difficult, things like policing and something else. But initially, getting people around something to do with nature is a really good neutral way of, of getting everybody at least to turn up on the day or to turn up to, 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 to produce uh, ideas and then to look after it afterwards. Um, once people feel appreciated, I think I'm not I'm speaking to the converted here, once people feel appreciated and, and um, are uh, listened to, they, they will in general, and we will, we as humans, we will participate better. So it's buy-in from the local community is key for nature-based solutions in, in communities. Yeah. And so one of the innovations that we're developing in these projects is companies that do this type of, of, of uh, you're, you're familiar with Connected Dots that we started, we helped start when we were in Tourist Project, helping people to literally, in their case, connect the dot to, to across the silos. Um, in other, other pro projects, we've used uh, companies, or we've developed companies where people will, will just sit around a map or sit around, uh, you've done it yourself, if you're sitting around a large sheet of paper 
ideas come faster than you can write things down. And you've got the yellow stickies coming out and all the virals and, you know, and it works, works very fine. Capturing that and then actioning it and then allowing that to proceed through the, through the council. That's your job as a council to, to smooth its passage through the, the, the normal system to ensure that all the checks and balances are made and the finances and the safety and the insurance and so on. And then the community can still participate without feeling that they're secondary to the process. They're not just the recipient of a park, but they're the producer of a park. Okay, great. Maybe a little bit more of a technical question here, Marcus. Yeah, um, <laughs> so somebody's written, life cycle carbon analysis indicates that green walls produce more carbon emissions through their construction and maintenance than they absorb through the plant life they support over 25 years. Mm -hmm. Is there any development in the field focused on reducing the embodied carbon problem? Um, yes, there is. And actually, the, the life cycle analysis could show a lot, even like, you know, um, electric cars and so on. They, they all are terrible, terrible for the environment initially at, this, at, at our current level of technical know-how. There is the second generation of the, the uh, construction, the materials that are being used on buildings is now uh, they're focusing on less carbon um, and less uh, destructive materials, more recyclables. Um, they are they technically are recyclable, but not everywhere has not every country has the ability to recycle certain materials, and so therefore the exporting of all that material is producing carbon, the carbon that you're hoping to offset by planting the the, the walls. So yes, there there I, I did say at the start that it's not a panacea. We are still like there's still a lot of um, this goes back to some of the barriers to scaling out these, but but just like any other project. I remember when I, I got this house uh, renovated about um, 12, 13 years ago, you couldn't get a, a solar panel in the Republic of Ireland. You, and they were the water ones, not the electric ones. So we had to get a company from Northern Ireland. Now you can buy them in B&Q. Okay, so 10 years later, you can get them, in, at, you can probably get them at your local DIY shop. So if we think about nature-based solutions in that sort of frame of mind, that in 10 years time, it will be normal to buy these materials and they will be, the, the economy of scale then will kick in and there'll be a significantly more reasonable price. And then of course, as a local authority or a housing developer, the economy of scale will be much, much more attractive in, in the same way as bulk buying of slates or bricks are. So yeah, it will, it, I, could totally, I totally take the thing, but it, you know, obviously, you know, the, the walls themselves also have cement and there's a lot of things. We're not going to, it, it isn't a, a simple, quick fix solution here. It's part of a general trend of solutions to become more sustainable and, uh, as, a, as a society. And if we're living in a sustainable building, we ourselves will become more sustainable so the next generation doesn't accept embedded carbon anymore. That's what we're worried. So it's behavior yeah. change. And that's key. It's, it's key to creating a, a society and a community for the next generation that they want to live in. So we're, mm. we're leaving them with, with somewhere mm. better than, uh, or somewhere that that's you know sustainable that they inherit mm, now mm -hmm. i've just one final question marcus before we wrap up sure. and it's just uh what advice would you give to anyone listening today who would be interested in, in integrating a nature-based solution into their area or their housing development or their city or their town or their village and, and mm -hmm. we have thousands across the country well we have examples around ireland of where constructed wetlands have been put into communities um with with a, with a very minimal amount of effort and creating a, a new park, bizarrely enough, if you think about it. Um, so it, retrofitting is, 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 is it's very, again, one of those immediate, how much, how old the buildings are, what structures they are, what some places just cannot, cannot take retrofitting in, in what we're talking about here, unless you do a significant engineering uh, works to the, to the buildings, some cases, it may be possible. Some of the old apartment complexes are built out of, of, of um, reinforced cement. They will have the structure. If you can land a helicopter on the roof, you can, land, you can put a living structure on the roof. Um, so some, some um, design specifications are emerging now for engineers and architects. Living roofs, especially living walls, are on the way. We know about sustainable drainage and constructive wetlands. So we have got the, the technical knowledge in its not just prototype stage and it's working stage. It's still early, but working stage. So we do have examples. The, diffi the difficult difficulty is it has to be site specific. So if you live in a town that has Clon in its name, like Clun, which means the flooded meadow, like, you know, Cl uh, Clontarf or uh, Clonmel or Clonar, they're all going to flood because that's, 
it's in the name. And so we, will, we, we know that the nature-based solution we're looking for there can only attenuate a certain amount of water after which time it, it becomes part of the flood itself. We, we can only do so much. So it isn't going to be as easy as, as, as just taking an area, retrofitting it to, to, to sink water and maybe making it a playground at the same time. But being that these type of floods may only happen once every two or three decades, um, getting closer together nowadays, um, you know, this might be a viable option for, for cities and councils to put in these, these types of, of um, nature-based solutions. And there usually are spaces because there's an existing playground. So rather than the playground being up high, it's down low, so it'll absorb water because during a flood, the kids aren't going to be out there playing anyway. This is what they've done in Rotterdam. They've got the Rotterdam the play, play, playground gardens. There's no grass or anything. They're just very awful cement or, or stone. Um, but they, they, do, they do a fantastic function. They, they sink a significant amount of water uh, for flooding. Um, the Suds area up in Pelletstown, as we know, from, will, is designed to take any overflow from the canal. So th this, is, this can very easily be built into uh, and retrofitted in. It's more difficult when we're trying to encourage people not to pave over their gardens or you know, their, the area outside their houses. And it's a very difficult sell to tell people that grass verge outside your house that's on the street there, if, that was, if there was a dip in this, means you can't park your car up on top of it, which, you know, <laughs> people, the guys in Glasgow, I get people in Glasgow got very annoyed about this and Art kept coming out with wheelbarrows to fill the thing in uh, when no one was looking. So sometimes it's, it's, it's about not just engaging with people, but also telling them what, why you've done this and why it's important. Because by putting this there, your house won't flood next year. Yeah, and it's like, and that's that's the whole point to get the information out there, and it's to improve knowledge, and it's to engage people with the topic. Yeah, and I suppose that's honest, one of the honest engagement too. Honest engagement, like it's just saying, look, this is not going to solve all our problems, but it's a lot better than nothing. So you know, and we're doing it for you. It's not going to cost you anything, but it means that your insurance company won't be blaming you if your house flood because we have this. You can argue there is a flood system outside, and um, you're trying your best. So you know, it's up now to to uh, you know the homeowners to to do their bit. And so you know, people people taking more control over their lives. I, I suppose it's difficult in a social housing context when people are renting to do that, but people want to in general want to participate. And certainly, if you're in a community, a, a new community, you tend to want to. Uh, people tend to want to work together on, on various things, you know, helping elderly people and so on and so forth. This is a way of harnessing some of that goodwill and, and, and ex energy. Brilliant. Okay, Marcus, on that note, it's five to one. And I uh, would like to thank you very much for your presentation and the discussion on nature based solutions. It was very informative and we simulated a great discussion. And I have a lot of questions there that are quite lengthy, so I will pass them on. Um, I see them that's nice. okay. Yeah. I'd like to thank my colleague Mary Coffey for helping organising the webinar series and I'd like to thank all our participants today but also those who have been here with us over the last few weeks who have listened, participated in the discussions and, and made for an interesting series. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar we're hoping to have a second series in the autumn so if anyone has any suggestions for topics please do send them in. And also if you've been inspired in any way by the webinar series would like more information or require further support please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, thanks again uh, for listening. Thanks again, Marcus, and we will see you all very soon. Okay, thank you very much and goodbye.